Voices from the Heart of Gotham. The undergraduate oral history collection at Gunman Community College has uncovered the New York experience through the eyes of immigrants and working class communities of color. Narratives are collected by trusted loved ones, which provoke stories and memories that could only be evoked due to the intimacy between interviewers and interviewees. We, the researchers before you today, embody the diversity of our city. Our project dived into the Black, Indigenous, people of color, and immigrant communities that Gutman students come from, that we come from, to ask, who are these people so influential to the character of our city? What obstacles have they faced, sacrifices have they made, and dreams have they pursued? How have the dual traumas of pandemics and injustice transformed their identities? Our presentation today will focus on the ways Goodman Community College students and alumni through oral history have uncovered and honor the pain and determination of largely working class immigrant communities and communities of colors in difficult times. In addition, we will delve into our personal goals as researchers and also address the ethical considerations inherent in recounting personal narratives of individuals by highlighting how our viewpoints enhance the overall richness of this endeavor. This oral history work added additional dimension to my ability to advocate and allow others to advocate for themselves. In the classroom, we see so many students who are shy, but when they have opportunities to explore their own communities through oral history, they are able to shine. This work has shown that many immigrants came alone, and some without a familiar face in the city of 9 million. What awaited them is a history etched in the fabric of New York, but rarely recorded as central to the American history. This project is designed, executed, and curated by us, the students at Gutman Community College, collectively working to challenge harmful narratives about the communities from which we and our classmates derive. Through this project, our words and our voice have a great impact on how the stories we tell are heard by the public. The sentiment was echoed by interview and fellow student researcher Pashir Yumwara when he explained during his interview. The reality is that when you are telling your story, you know better than someone else wanted for you because you are living through the experience. Only a diverse group of youth researchers can unveil the joys and obstacles we have faced to get to college and during the, the past few years. It is only fitting that a group of mostly immigrants communicates the messages born in this archive. It allows for originality that makes this work much more clearly delivered. When we gathered for our collective analysis session, we struggled with questions of ethics. Whose stories are these? Do we have the right to publish with the people we interviewed, or are we engaging in trauma porn to tell the stories of immigrants and people of color in the United States? While all the technical aspects of informed consent had been followed, these deep questions about stories, representations, vulnerabilities linger about our responsibility to correct the racist, xenophobic record on diversity in New York City, and our debt to honor the vulnerability and courage of our participants. Our research collective decided we had to write through these ethical questions with snippets of our own lives and our collective dialogue. When I, the daughter of immigrants, started writing prompts in January of 2022 to apply for colleges, I had stories in my heart and ethics on my mind. I began to reflect on the stories I had heard about my parents, about the obstacles they face, burdens they bear, and triumphs they experience. I began to notice just how much influence these had sculpting my character. As I sat in front of my keyboard prepared to tell a story of generational endurance that shaped me, I paused. I wanted to talk about my parents because they matter so much to me, but I did not want to take advantage of their struggle or pain for my personal gain. I ended up writing a poem on my personal issue with social anxiety, deciding that my parents' story didn't belong to me. To this day, I wonder about the delicate practice of publishing people's stories in ways that honor but do not exploit them. The question of ethics comes up every time we want to share a story that isn't our own. The thought of accurately sharing narratives while expressing the positive attributes and devastating struggles of the people we love. Many of us read stories about people or hear them, and sometimes we forget about the person it belongs to. We watched our family struggle. These are not abstractions. Our hope with the oral history project, and I would add my own history, is that we can step away from appropriating and into appreciating to give credit to the journey and the struggle. New York City is one of the most diverse places on the planet, and I think when people hear all these interviews about people living in New York City, 
BIPOCAN immigrants, listeners can particularly relate to it. It could give them the inspiration to talk more about their own experiences. They don't even have to be immigrants or people of color. They could just be regular white folks living in America. For, it, for instance, Carmen Castro, immigrant from Puerto Rico, describes her struggles when she moved here that wouldn't be exactly the average American experience. They don't pay me not a penny. I had to be washing clothes all morning from seven o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. There was no food, no nothing. They treated me like a dog. When people hear these histories of people like Carmen Castro, it can open up a new world to them and show them the struggles of people to whom they usually don't relate. Hearing and reading the human histories of immigrants preparing for and overcoming the obstacles they face only serves to demonstrate how despite having to start from scratch in the U.S. to attain their objectives, they are often able to keep their heads held high. Many immigrant activists and working class New Yorkers have found common struggles in reviewing these testimonies while learning resistance strategies employed by others. We could have totally different backgrounds, but the obstacles that we face can be very similar. Araceli Sotero's decades old social struggles wrapped up in learning English can provide comfort through shared struggle to newly arriving immigrants. Otero explains, when you come to this country, they only speak English. If you didn't, they would make fun of you, your accent. That's why there were so many people who were so scared of speaking English, because so many people would make fun of you. Immigrants involved in this project have heard their stories in the testimonies of complete strangers. Javier, an immigrant from Ecuador, explained, I didn't really go out because I didn't speak the language, so nobody really talked to me and I didn't speak to anybody. Viserys, a fellow researcher, researcher concurred, arriving at, from Benin at 16, he narrated, It wasn't easy. I lived in the projects and went to school there. It was really harsh because I didn't speak any English. His interviewer followed up with, But this didn't discourage you in any way? And then Viserys retorted, No, it didn't. Immigrants have to face reality quickly when they get here. One part of that reality being the language barrier present in all aspects of their daily life. For Nara, coming from the country of Portugal, it was particularly difficult to speak a language other than Portuguese. She narrates, for me, it was really hard because there wasn't much opportunity because I didn't speak English. The way that I communicated with people was either in Portuguese or I wrote down on a piece of paper what I wanted to ask. Being an immigrant, a fellow a youth researcher recalls a history provoked by being confronted with this data. When I first got to the United States, not knowing much English and listening to people speaking English all around me, it was like an endless rally in my ears. The drive to be here in the United States and pull through or their families is one of the things that gives immigrants the motivation to find ways to understand, learn, and speak English however they can. Immigrants today and historically threw themselves into settings where understanding and being understood progresses definitively until they are able to learn to speak English. I feel a deep responsibility to educate and inspire those around me to share their stories in a safe space. Many people fear judgment, but I believe that these narratives can profoundly impact the lives of others. As a first-generation immigrant from Pakistan who moved to the United States in 2010, my life has undergone significant changes. My parents had dreams of a better life and more opportunities for their children in this new land. However, when I reflect critically on my experiences in this country, I can't ignore the hurdles that I face simply because I'm an immigrant and a Muslim. In 2020, during an interview with Luz Hidalgo, I candidly expressed my initial bleak expectations for the U.S., fearing racism and discrimination. These fears were validated when I encountered ignorant comments from peers during my middle school years, some even making derogatory remarks about my culture and religion by calling me a terrorist. 
This caused me to hesitate wearing a hijab despite my parents' wishes because I feared further isolation. As I grew older, I became aware that fearing isolation at school was the least of my worries. I started to understand that I wasn't the only one in my family who felt out of place and experienced the same isolation and fear. Conducting an interview with my sister for this project allowed us to delve into her perspective, sparking more candid discussions about our shared experiences in the U.S. so far. During our conversation, she recounted a distressing incident when she faced verbal harassment on the subway, with a white man aggressively insisting that she should leave the country. Besides personal experiences with prejudice, our immigration status restrictions prevented us from attending our grandfather's and uncle's funerals. My mother couldn't bid farewell to her dying father or console her family back in Pakistan. I vividly remember watching my grandfather's funeral through a phone call. A heartbreaking experience for both me and my family. Two years later, we faced a similar situation when my father's brother succumbed to cancer. As the years pass, the prospect of more funerals via FaceTime weighs on us, compounding our emotional burden. These hardships have left us bitter and discontent with the life we have built in America. I see how tired my father is and sense the isolation my mother experiences due to the limited understanding of English and the unfamiliar customs of the country. Despite my father having earned his bachelor's and coming to the U.S. with a full-time office job, he now works as an Uber driver to support his family. There is deep pain in knowing that people get into his car and look down on him without knowing anything about him or the sacrifices that he has made for his family. But having the opportunity to share my story enables me to better understand and come to terms with our experiences, while also advocating for my family and fellow immigrants who have faced similar challenges. As happened with Sadaf and Samantha, as we square our errors to Akai, we found narrative of violence in home countries, economic exploitation, racial discrimination, terrifying and born, born children ban, story of set of violence, by police and employees been beaten and criminalized for their for their collective resistance. Working with stories from archive provoked my desire to explore my own immigrant narrative. On October 2nd, 1958, the street of Conakry, Republic of Guinea's capital, where people protesters. On that day, Conakry was a city flooded with people with one unique ambition of liberty, a day that changed the course of history not only for Guinea, but all African countries under French control. I met a secretary and activist, political leader, who became the first president of Guinea, said to de Gaulle, the French president at that time. Dans nous préférons la pauvreté dans la liberté à l'opulence dans l'esclavage. You prefer poverty from freedom to opulence and slavery. On that day, Guinea became the first African country under the French control to gain its independence and the second country in West Africa after Ghana, 1957. I was born in this country where freedom and liberty mean everything. So by this history, as far back I can remember, I have considered myself as an activist, a person with ambition to contribute to second solution to social issues. In May 2019, I crossed the U.S.-Mexican border and entered American soil which automatically puts me one of the categories of naturalized immigrant. A naturalized immigrant is either who crossed the border unlawfully or who was admitted legally and has overstayed their visa. My ambition to participate in dealing with social issues has not changed, but as soon as I realized, I realized that if we view as threat by the state authorities, my activism could lead to my deportation. The study of being a lawful immigrant or just being an immigrant catered certain barriers easily transcended by US citizens. Our vulnerability to be criminalized is intense. After the killing of George Floyd by a police officer, Derek Sovereign, in 2020, I was like millions of New Yorkers revolted by the, soci by the social injustice and the violence perpetrated by the law enforcement and the government that employs it. When mass protests, mass protests erupted, when mass protests erupted in New York City, I had this strong desire to join the movement industry to give a voice to my trade. 
post I was reminded by my sister that my immigration status could result in a very problem for me. She reminded me that violating a law can cause a loss of my permanent resident status, something I had yet to obtain. This tips the fear of deportation purposely created by the U.S. immigration law and policy have placed, have placed a measure on immigrants who, like other U.S. residents, want to demand more equitable society. New challenge to freedom and poverty or plans to slavery, poverty, citizenship, racism, and potential for deportation haunt my everyday existence. Comparison to my West African homeland, with it independent but unstable political institution born in the aftermath of centuries of European empire and U.S. imperialism, have silenced many of my fellow immigrants. In the double jeopardy, the thinking goes, who am I to criticize the democracy when I come from a country that never know an elected president, a country where autocracy has been dominated has been the dominant political force since we achieved independence half a century ago. They serve that uncouraged immigrant self censorship on social and political issues in the United States. Hovering in our collective consciousness is anti immigrant referring so often tossed around the name of patriotism. If you don't like he, why don't you go back to your country? A cause of structural violence and fear leaving our bodies. Last year, while I was an Uber driver, I was approached by a group, a group of food delivery workers who were trying to organize delivery workers to come together to protest for improved working conditions. Our exploitation is vast. The need for organizing is great. They asked me to get in touch with other African workers. I overcome my own status and those Anxiety about challenging the system to be more equitable, only to be confronted with the overwhelming fear voiced by my fellow West African immigrants. As soon as I started to get in touch with them, I found out that the terror of state enforced consequences are punishment for organizing for safer conditions and living wages it was a cripple in the moment to de- design to recognize the dignity of Uber workers. This fear of stepping out of the saddle had their consequences for my community, and yet is the, des- the desired outcome for the U.S. economic system that depends on exploitable workers. I have seen a delivery guy hit by a car but not call the ambulance because he is undocumented. I have seen a food delivery worker's bike being stolen but he did not report to the police because of fear of some possible consequences because of the immigration status. If we induce and a law enforcement prevent this community from organizing for better wages and conditions, the system has been carefully built to value these vulnerable people without consequence. So often justice is deferred for a community to encourage to remain invisible and silent. We are reminded by the opening brief story that exploitation and putting marginalized groups against each other Save the way and stab your desire to profit for profit and capital. Within a system that I firmly believe is designed to limit the emancipation of the immigrant population, some fearless immigrant folk to have a seat at the table because they need one thing. Either you have a seat at the table, either you are the minimum. As soon as this affirmation became clear to me, I decided not to have my hands in my pocket. I decided to keep them out and seek any opportunity that New York and its citizens had to offer. I went back to high school to finish my unfinished high school business, and with our second third, I jumped into, into a college journey. Beginning, I got my community college, where the support from the college community led me to achieve some great things, which I honestly was not expecting. Being the son of the post-war urban studies, I was and being on the then list for two years that I have spent it as some valuable contribution to change the narrative about immigrants. It's not me saying that my mission is complete. After spending 10 weeks of internship with bank defenders and six weeks with Manhattan Board One, 
I'm now a, I'm now a hunter student where I probably spending some semesters for urban policy and planning. Our journey began as college students, initially tackling what seemed like just another assignment. However, as the past few years have unfolded, each one of us has transformed into a dedicated researcher. We all have undergone profound change in perspective as we learn to critically evaluate the steps we've taken to complete this project. We have meticulously edited and transcribed interviews, diligently analyzed recurring themes and patterns within these interviews, organized these themes into chapters, and pinpointed relevant quotes to support our findings. We then proceed to provide in-depth elaboration of these quotes. For us, this project is an important form of activism. I now look at myself as a person who assisted to advocate for my fellow immigrants throughout their hardship and journey to the United States. The stories we put out there are not the everyday stories that people normally read about. Therefore, advocating and spreading these simultaneously heartbreaking and uplifting stories will help the nation value the immigrants of which they are so dependent. Conducting and curating these interviews as an immigrant myself put me in the shoes of my interviewee and allowed us both to find strength in the commonality of our journeys. Further, because I and many of the interviewees at Gutman are immigrants ourselves, we designed better questions informed by our own experiences and could empathize with immigrant interviewees in ways that cultivated a sense of unity through shared struggle. Thank you.